Fred, there's no sound. How about now, Jeff? I can hear you now. Okay, I'm gonna go mute and then you won't hear any sounds, but we can hear you. Go ahead, anytime start, as long as you, can you see the uh, midway slide? There's no slide. Mm, okay, one more time, I'll do it. How about now? Yes. There we go. Thank you, Fred. Uh, welcome, uh, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, to the uh, USS Midway presentation of the Midway story. You're seeing the uh, ship as it's moored in San Diego now as a museum at Navy Pier. Next. And this is an overview of the Midway Museum tied up in the Navy Pier, as you can see, right adjacent to downtown San Diego. Next. So the Midway story is the story of a ship that was in uh, service of the United States for 47 years between 1945 and 1991. The Midway was commissioned on 10 September of 1945, just eight days after the surrender of Japan and Tokyo Bay on 8 September of 1945. The Midway is the longest serving aircraft carrier in the U.S. Navy. It is when the Midway started its journey in 1945, it was the largest ship in the world. It was also the first carrier to have a steel deck. And the Midway saw three home ports, first one in Norfolk, Virginia, between 1945 and 1954. The second home port was in Alameda, California, in uh, between 1958 and 1973, and then Yokosuka, Japan, in 1973 through 1991. In this presentation, you will see a ship that sailed the oceans of the world. <clears throat> the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific, the Mediterranean Sea, the Labrador Sea, the North Sea, the Aegean Sea, and the Arabian Gulf. The Midway deployed to Vietnam three times between 1965 and 1973. And in 1991, Midway fought in Desert Storm, flying combat sorties and was the tactical command ship of all new US Navy forces in that area. And the, the Midway also conducted humanitarian evacuations, which were part of its mission. The evacuation of Kuimoi uh, Man, Mansu crisis, the evacuation of the end of the Vietnamese war, and the evacuation of military personnel after the eruption of Mount Penatubo in the Philippines. Next. Next. As you can see, uh, the Midway is actually the story of three lives, one on active duty, the next its life in the boneyard and its trip to San Diego, and then finally today, its life at the USS Midway Museum. Next. Uh, the Midway was uh, <clears throat> named in honor of the Battle of Midway. Next. And as you can see, we're I'm showing here the famous SBD uh, 
Devastator dive bombers that participated in the Battle of Midway on 4 June 1942. Next. This is the Navy torpedo plane coming in to attack a Japanese carrier. Next. And the uh, torpedo bomber has uh, lost its fish in this case. Next. So first part of this presentation will be of the active duty service between 1945 and 1991. Next. As you can see, the ship was launched in 1945 from uh, the Naval Shipyard in Newport News, Virginia. Next. Its first commander was Captain Joseph Bolger. Next. And the Midway was the first of a class of Midway carriers, of which there were three. Next. Of course, the Midway was the lead carrier of the group. The, the second uh, carrier is the Roosevelt CV-42. It was commissioned in October of 1945. And then comes the Coral Sea CV-43, which was uh, commissioned in October of 1947. Truly, the Midway was an engineering marvel which was constructed between 1943 and 1945. <clears throat> it was the first Navy ship to be too large to pass through the Panama Canal. It was four years in design, and believe it or not, there were 90 tons of blueprints put this ship together. It took a year and a half to build. Uh, displayed uh, displaced 45,000 tons, and it's the first carrier to have a steel flight deck. Next. This is a picture of the, the build process, 1944 uh, through 1945. John, just note, you, you seem to be moving, shuffling papers, and we're hearing a lot of background noise. So be mindful of that. OK, thank you. So this next slide is a picture of uh, the, the midway under construction, but this happens to be the hangar deck level. Then <clears throat> over the course of the life of uh, the midway, there were flight deck changes from a straight deck in 1945 to a change in 1957 to a nine degree angle deck. And then in 1970, a third degree, 13 degree angle deck. As you can see here, straight deck on the left, and then in 1987, a picture of the 13 degree angle deck of the carrier. This uh, <clears throat> illustrates uh, the uh, straight deck uh, for the carrier in 1945, but the number one challenge for straight deck landings was to avoid uh, hitting. The, any aircraft that were parked up in the catapult area uh, beyond the arresting cables. So the solution to this was to uh, provide multiple arresting cables, which you can see in this illustration. And in the case of the Midway, there were 14 different arresting cables prior to the uh, catapult area. Next. And this is uh, just another picture of the straight deck. And another one with the ship underway. And in this case, uh, loaded with aircraft. And the uh, top view of what the straight deck carrier looked like. So in March of 1946, uh, the Midway participated in Operation Frostbite in subarctic cold weather conditions in the Labrador Sea. The main purpose of this operation was to see if they could function 
with their aircraft, specifically the Ryan FR fire, Fireball, and to test out helicopter rescue techniques in cold weather. This illustrates uh, their position in the Labrador Sea, uh, sandwiched between Greenland and Newfoundland. This is the aircraft they were testing, the Fire Ryan Fireball RF. And as you can see, it was quite a challenge. They had snow on the um, on the flight deck, and you can see the Ryan Fireball aircraft parked at the stern of the ship. And you can see the magnitude of the challenge here with the snow. And again, the challenge of keeping their aircraft operational. And then we get to the family pictures. Uh, and in this case, uh, the family had a potential weapon at hand. And you'll see in the next picture, and as is the case with most families, the weapon at hand and the fight began. And this is uh, a picture of trying to maintain the condition of the aircraft uh, to be flight worthy in subarctic conditions. And then in March of 1947, the Midway participated in Operation Sandy. And that actually is the dawn of the US Navy missile uh, program. And it occurred about 200 miles south of Bermuda. And this is a picture of the V-2 rocket, the captured V-2 rocket that was part of this test, which was to test whether or not a missile could be launched from the flight deck of the uh, USS Midway. And the fact that uh, Midway had a three-inch steel flight deck made this uh, test feasible. And here you can see the actual launch of the V-2 missile off the stern of the carrier. And two more uh, pictures of the actual launch itself. And then finally, uh, when the rocket uh, reached about 15,000 feet, it broke up and, and came back uh, in, in uh, pieces into the uh, Atlantic Ocean. And then in October of 1947, the Midway made its first deployment to the Med 6th Fleet. And then on February of 1948, in heavy seas, unfortunately, a uh, Liberty launch capsized and we lost eight sailors to that accident. And this happened just off uh, the coast of Toulon, France, in the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. This is a picture of... Uh, a tragedy aboard uh, the Midway, a landing of an F-9F Panther uh, producing uh, fire on the flight deck, and uh, it killed the pilot. Then uh, the Midway participated in Operation Main Brace, which turns out to be a um, very pivotal operation to the future of all uh, U.S. aircraft carriers. In this operation, it was a NATO operation, and uh, the U.S. had noticed that the U HMS Triumph for the British had uh, made successful angle deck uh, attempts, and so the Midway uh, actually drew an angle deck or painted an angle deck on its flight deck and conducted. Um, several touch and go landings and it turned out to be a success and led to widespread adoption of the angle deck and you might ask well what is the significant advantage of 
Could we go back to the last? Yeah. What is the significant advantage? Well, actually, proceed forward. One more. I'm sorry. Go go back. One more. So you might ask the significant advantage of uh, an angle deck. Well, its biggest advantage is the ability to be able to recover high-speed jet aircraft. The angle deck uh, provided three options. Uh, if the pilot missed the cable coming in at 150, 160 miles an hour, they could do a touch and go without hitting any other, any other aircraft on the carrier. Secondly, if the pilot uh, caught an arresting cable and the cable broke, it allowed for a touch and go. And then finally, should it happen, if the uh, pilot's uh, hook uh, broke, it could also, uh, the, the pilot could also touch and go and make a barrier landing. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. Next. Mm -hmm. Then in uh, <clears throat> 1954, in the Mediterranean under heavy seas, under a underway replenishment, the uh, <clears throat> Midway collided with the supply ship USS Great Sitkin. Next. This is a ship of the, this is a picture of the Sitkin, <clears throat> excuse me, the Sitkin. And as you can see, we have the replenishment underway in very close quarters between the Midway, the supply ship, and a destroyer outboard. Then upon breakaway, uh, both the Sitkin and the uh, Midway collided. In the case of the Midway, it would be the starboard quarter uh, <clears throat> damaging, seriously damaging one of their five inch guns. And then on the Sitkin, some minor damage to their port quarter. Mm -hmm. Then uh, 27 December 54, the Norfolk sailed, uh, the Midway sailed from Norfolk to Taiwan. And participated in the Quimoy Mas Matsu crisis, which is dubbed in uh, our, our naval terms, where it was participating in potentially the first nuclear crisis because uh, this was called the second Taiwan Straits crisis between China and nationalist China. And China was um, <clears throat> shelling the shores between uh, mainland China and two islands off the coast near the Takan Islands. And um, this was uh, a test by the Chinese mainland to see just how far the U.S. would go to defend nationalist China. And in actuality, the United States put uh, an attack with nuclear weapons on the table during this crisis. Event, the Midway flew air cover for uh, a, the battle between the nationalist forces in mainland China and eventually evacuated 15,000 Chinese nationalist troops and 20,000 Chinese civilians. Then in 1955, the uh, Midway went back to uh, Seattle for a two year shipyard overhaul and extensive modernization, where the Midway received its first angle deck, which was a nine degree deck. It's a picture of the uh, shipyard in Puget Sound. And after two years, we see next. We see a modification that shows the angle deck. In this case, we now see two outboard elevators uh, and we see three uh, catapults, two forward and one on the angle deck. And then forward, we're seeing two uh, jet blast um, 
screens uh, up in the forward area of the launch area of the ship. Next. And this is a picture of the nine degree angle deck of the carrier. And another picture of the same configuration. Then <clears throat> the USS Midway participated in the first autopilot landing on a carrier uh, with hands off of both the controls and the throttle. The landing was made from controls operated by equipment on the USS Midway off the coast of California. And this was a result of 16 years research by the Navy to accomplish this feat. Uh, uh, F-4A Phantom was the first aircraft to land in a hands-off condition by Lieutenant Commander Randall Billens. And the, and the second aircraft was an F-8D Crusader uh, piloted by Lieutenant Commander Robert Chu. In April 65, the Midway deployed to Vietnam, striking uh, military and logistics targets in both North and South Vietnam. And then in 17 June of 65, the Midway gets its first kill of a Russian MiG fighter. Two uh, <clears throat> F-4 Phantoms took out two MiG fighters. And then, oddly enough, we have a uh, prop Navy A-1 Sky Raider downing, actually three of them, downing two uh, Russian MiGs. And it turns out uh, the three Sky Raiders are launched on a rescue mission for, to find a F-105 pilot who was downed over, over Vietnam. The rescue pilots were uh, Lieutenant Commander Greathouse, Lieutenant J.G. Lynn, and Lieutenant Johnson. All these pilots then, when they were airborne and over Vietnam, were notified by a Navy destroyer. There was incoming unidentified aircraft approaching, which turned out to be two uh, Russian MiGs. And <clears throat> the MiGs uh, started the engagement by firing uh, rockets at the A-1 Sky Raiders, who then immediately dove to 500 feet and traveled close to the ground in uh, deep valley territory of Vietnam. And they, these uh, A-1 Sky Riders turned inside the MiGs, and eventually they finally were able to uh, make a turn on both MiGs and down two MiGs with uh, three A-1 Sky Raiders. In 1966, uh, the Midway returned to San Francisco for another massive modernization, which took four years to complete. In 1970, the modifications were complete. They had a new angle deck at 13 degrees. The flight deck was increased to four acres. The elevators were enlarged and they increased their capacity two times. The more sophisticated steam catapults were installed and a, a program uh, a balloon from an $80 million uh, modification to $200 million. And in uh, 31 January 1970, uh, Midway turned to active duty. And unfortunately, all the modifications that were made in, in San Francisco uh, worsened the seakeeping ability of the Midway in rough seas. Next. <clears throat> this is a, a picture of the Midway as it's configured in 1970 and today as a museum with the 13 degree angle deck. In May of 1971, the Midway deployed back to Vietnam to strike targets 
on both North and South Vietnam. Then October of 71, he returned back to his base in Alameda, California. And a short time later in 1972, they were redeployed back to Vietnam, again, striking targets uh, off of Yankee Station in both North and South Vietnam. And then after that deployment in Vietnam, the USS Midway proceeds to a new home port in Yokosuka, Japan. And Yokosuka Naval Base is located just south of, of Tokyo. And I might add, uh, home porting in Yokosuka was the first time a U.S. Navy aircraft carrier was ever home ported outside the United States. Then in April of 1975, the Midway uh, conducted um, a rescue operations in Operation Frequent Wind and um, rescued various Vietnamese from uh, from Saigon and South uh, Vietnam. And during that rescue operation, we had a very unusual landing on the ship. There was a Lieutenant Duang of the Vietnamese Air Force who was trying to escape Vietnam and loaded his family, his wife and five children onto a single engine VNAT-01 aircraft and flew out to sea to find a rescue. Uh, he was dangerously low on fuel, but he did find the Midway and circled the Midway trying to make contact with the ship, but to no avail. He resorted to writing a note, which he attached to his pistol, flew low over the Midway and dropped that note on the flight deck. The Midway Captain Chambers, uh, read the note and ordered the crew to push a number of planes overboard to make room for uh, the Vietnamese pilot to land. And sure enough, he made a very dangerous landing on the Midway. And um, of course, the, the crew went wild knowing the situation in which, under which he landed. And eventually the crew members of the Midway subsequently campaign to collect money so that the family could immigrate to the United States, which they did. Next. Now, 1979, <clears throat> we were dealing, the Midway was dealing with all these Cold War calculations and Russian taunts. And as you can see from this photograph, we see a Russian bear uh, doing a flyover, probably no more than three, 400 feet above the midway. Then in July of 1980, the midway has a collision with the freighter Cactus. And this occurs just uh, in the Singapore, Singapore Straits in Asia. And you can see here just south of Singapore itself. And the merchant ship, ship Cactus sustained damage in its bow and it ripped uh, the port side of the Midway with its bow. And you will see here in a minute, it was loaded with lumber. And you can see this is the port side of the Midway taking out some of the aircraft up on the flight deck. The damage is clearly visible here. And then, unfortunately, two sailors were killed when the bow did rip, rip through the hangar deck area of the ship. In 1986, 
uh, to address the seakeeping issues that persisted with the uh, USS Midway blisters were added to improve the heavy sea performance. Uh, this was a $138 million retrofit, but the, actually the blisters added to the problem. And in October of 1988 in uh, Typhoon in the Japan Sea, fortunately, USS Midway survived a 26 degree roll to then forever be known as the rock and roll carrier as you will see in this photograph, the ship is taking uh, in excess of a 26 degree roll, and fortunately, it didn't continue its roll. In 1986, uh, the F-4 Phantom was replaced by the FAA-19 Hornet on the ship. And then in 1990, in Operation Desert Storm, USS Midway participated. And the ship ran uh, some 228 sorties from the Midway in support of Operation Desert Storm. The Midway itself was part of Battle Force Zulu and was the tactical, tactical command uh, carrier in Battle Force Zulu, comprised of the Midway, the Ranger CV-61, USS America CV-66, and then the US Roosevelt CVM-71, which we'll see in this formation of four carriers, a rare sight indeed, at the USS Midway in the upper left portion of this picture. And then finally, the USS Midway conducted an evacuation operation, Operation Fiery Vigil, when Mount Pinatubo of the Philippines, just north of um, Manila, erupted. It was a major eruption. And I don't think I'd want to be the, the person driving this truck trying to get away from uh, uh, a fiery ash coming at you at 200 miles an hour. The U.S. Midway evacuated Clark Air Force Base and evacuated its Navy base at Subic Bay, all told uh, evacuating some 20,000 people. And then in August of 1991 was the last cruise. Midway departs Yokosuka Navy Base for Pearl Harbor. And comes in an iconic photograph of the Midway leaving uh, in giving its sayonara goodbye with <clears throat> all of the ship's crew in, in dress whites. Mm -hmm. And then 23 August of 1991, there was a change of command in Pearl Harbor between U.S. Independence and the Midway. Bravo Zulu, USS Midway on its active duty of from 47 years for the United States of America. Next. This is a picture of the Midway with its 13 degree angle deck, the crew in dress whites. Now, next please. Now there is an 11 year life from the Navy Boneyard, next. Uh, Midway was decommissioned 11 April at the North Island Navy Station in San Diego. And they give their last salute to the ship. And it rested at the uh, <clears throat> boneyard in Bremerton, Washington, at the US Navy base. Then there was an 11 year trek to get it down to the museum. It took some $5 million. The, less, the Navy was less than unanimous in its support for the concept of bringing the ship to San Diego to be a museum. And <clears throat> next. 
now the life as a museum in San Diego begins next. On 10 January of 2004, <clears throat> the ship is towed and put into place at Navy Pier in San Diego. As you can see, it's nestled in to its pier in downtown. And <clears throat> It holds its sway next to Navy Pier. There'll be a series of slides here if you'd go through them, please. And anybody who's walking the boardwalk can see it now. The question for everyone is, do you know that the Midway was also involved in the unconditional surrender? Next. Everybody recognizes this photograph in 1945 after the end of World War II. But next to the Midway is a piece of sculpture, which is called Unconditional Surrender. And uh, when they, anyone who visits the USS Midway can, can uh, see this uh, apropos sculpture in the um, park right adjacent to the Midway. Next. And this is the Midway as a museum. There are more than 800 volunteers at the museum. It has become a world renowned museum. And the TripAdvisor has named the USS Midway Museum as the number five museum in all of the United States. And in, in 2000, as you can see, the attendance has been increase, increasing every year. And in 2018, we had 1.3 million visitors uh, on the ship. We also, uh, the, the Midway Museum conducts uh, active duty military services, change of command ceremonies, uh, weddings, funerals, also the Midway is a host to corporate events scheduled uh, from time to time. And we also had a basketball game on the Midway flight deck between Michigan State and North Carolina. And the Midway is host to uh, students in uh, San Diego County. And every year they conduct a science program for 30,000 students in the San Diego area. And if you visit the Midway, you can get your picture taken uh, and go home with the uh, catapult shooter in, in the picture with you. Thank you very much. You are cordially invited to tour the USS Midway at any time. Thank you, John. It was a fascinating history of the um, the history of the Midway, both during its years of active duty and as a museum ship. Um, one of the things that uh, came to mind as you were speaking about the missile tests, uh, how do they launch a, a, a missile off of the flight deck without causing substantial damage to the to the deck or did was it we launch and then we re re resurface the deck? Well, they probably resurfaced it, but remember we're dealing with three inches of solid steel. So um, I really don't think, I don't know for sure, but I haven't read anything that said that there was major damage. I mean, as an ASW officer, I'm sure you got used to having to 
uh, repaint the launchers each time you'd fire an ASRock. Uh, <laughs> absolutely. The both <laughs> always loved you for it, right? Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see. A another question is, uh, how frequently did she need to replenish when she was at sea uh, during uh, deployment? Uh, on average, about every three or four days. Oh, you know, I, as a tin can sailor, I remember pulling alongside and taking a drink, but um, recognized that as much as we depended on carriers as well as AOs for our fuel, uh, they didn't have limited su unlimited supplies either. Well, so also uh, to give you a give you a feel for it, remember the USS Midway when it was underway was serving thirteen thousand meals per day. That's amazing. What was her crew size? I know uh, typically we have about 5,000 on somebody like the Carl Vinson. Um, were the Midway, crews larger back then or smaller? Uh, Midway had about 4,500 crew. Okay, so nearly, and did that include the uh, air wing or was that ship's company? That's ship's company. Okay, so with the air wing, you're, we're still getting close to about 5,000. I think so. Excellent. Uh, let's see if there are any other questions coming in. Um, I don't see any other questions. Uh, what's going to happen next is we will post this broadcast. I'll share the link with you so you can share it with uh, uh, members of the uh, museum family and, uh, and friends. I put it on the museum website. I'll also have it on the Continental Commandery's website. And I will post the link uh, to it at our uh, Continental Commandery's uh, LinkedIn uh, affinity group as well. So folks will be able to watch it, rewatch it, and also, of course, share it with those who weren't able to join us today. Um, with that, I want to thank you. I want to thank the folks who uh, uh, logged in to watch. And I know a lot of uh, members will watch it in their own time at 4 30 in the afternoon for those of us on the east coast a lot of folks are still at work and uh same thing as we go further west um but really appreciate your contribution today and your being with us and you're working through all of our uh, again we we continue to be on the learning curve in terms of the um technical challenges but but we adapted we improvised and we overcame so so truly appreciate that we're going to go ahead and end the broadcast.